I do a one one talk, probably kind of a little bit what you were talking about. Why does Genesis matter? You know, and um, in that in that it's it makes a difference in our relationship to God, wow. spiritual life, in our relationship to one another, and right. in the way we view our own life. And um, I just take it from those three aspects. It makes a difference how we view ourselves, our own life, if we believe that we're created by a powerful creator, God, who has a purpose and a plan for us, as opposed to if we think we just came about by accident and chance and our, our life is no more important than a worm or a toad or a pig or something, you know? Right, right. And then how do we determine what's right and what's wrong? And uh, I don't know, did I share that in this class? A girl in, we were doing a series in uh, in Wyoming one time in public school. And we did a whole week in the biology class, which was wonderful. And at the end of that time, we had a whole day that we used for Q&A. And one of the girls at that point, she says, why are you doing this anyway? Who cares? Oh, my goodness. In other words, what difference does it make? And so I asked her, well, are you an evolutionist? And she said, yes. And I said, well, as, as an evolutionist, how do you determine what's right and what's wrong? And she thought a minute and she says, I guess majority rules. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I propose that all girls with long blonde hair get tied up and thrown in the river. This was in Jackson, Wyoming. Now it's showing up, Dave. I think um, it might be. It I, I decided winter. not to try two screens. Okay. It was in the winter. It was in Jackson, Wyoming. And we said, I said, okay, so I propose all girls with long blonde hair get tied up and thrown in the river. And I, and I said, all, all in favor, say aye. You can imagine this is a high school class. <laughs> and all these guys are going, aye, aye, tie her up, throw her in the river. And some of the girls, too. And then oh, yeah. <laughs> all opposed and she raised her hand and I said well majority rules go ahead and tie her up throw her in the river these guys are getting up to do it and she's going you can't do that and I said why not she says it's wrong I said wait a minute you just told me the way we determine what's right and wrong is we take a vote majority rules <laughs> so tie her up and throw her in the river <laughs> I think the guys would have done it if I hadn't stopped them <laughs> But it really, it illustrates the point that if we do not have a foundation, if we don't have a creator who sets the boundary lines for us and tells us what our life is, to how to live our life on this world, then we are without a foundation. And evolution does not give us a foundation. No. In our society today, if we look at our society today, that's what we see all over, isn't it? People thinking, well, majority rules, even if it's 50 50 and we need a tiebreaker you know <laughs> it's like oh well that's a mandate from the people and i'm going nah it's you know it's pretty divided country then but we we have we have no basis or we or we think well the guy that can throw the football the furthest he ought to get to say or the guy that's the wealthiest or the beautiful singer or actors you know <laughs> how do we determine what's right and what's wrong and it and it brings us back to we need that foundation. We need that foundation that God gives us in his word. And so uh, we, use that, we use that kind of an illustration for that idea of why does it matter? What difference yeah. does it make? You know, my pet peeve is calling anything you read in the Bible a story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Genesis is not a story. It's an account. Yeah. And it just, and I think that, that the, that, that sort of even talking to children about, oh, let's have Bible story time. That you're telling them the same thing you tell them when you read them a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people need to be more um, adamant that it is the history of the world. Yeah, that's exactly written, right. Written by the Spirit of God. Do you uh, remember us talking about being in Mongolia and our translator that we were with for about a month? Uh, while we're in uh, Mongolia, uh, 
became well trained actually, but uh, he, uh, somebody came up and said, you know, every time you say in uh, the Bible, he doesn't ever use the word Bible. He uses a certain historical document. Um, and he never mentions Bible. And that was interesting because he was 100% right. The biblical mm -hmm. record is a certain historical document. Mm -hmm. And it's a very accurate one for at that. And he so, also knew that if he said Bible in a public building, we'd probably get arrested and thrown in jail. So he could have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we he knew that. We we were in Mongolia. We had a uh presentation to do in one of the villages and and here, right at the beginning of the lecture, here came three guys who, if you could have a stereotype picture in your mind of what a Mongolian communist might look like, mm -hmm. trench coats and all, mm -hmm. and they sat down in the front row and they crossed their arms and sat there and they listened to the whole program. Scowling, but, you know, but listening. At, at the end of the time, we had a Q&A session and... So one of these guys right away raised his hand and he says, could you tell us what is the difference between Buddhism and Christianity? And of oh. course, we wanted to answer that, right? I was all set. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave's all set to answer and he gets his check in his spirit. Don't answer that. And he's confused and he's looking. Like he, looks, he looks back at the missionary in the back row. The missionary's turning white and going like this. Yeah. And so, I don't know, Dave or me, one of us said, that's, yes. a, that's a great, that's a great question. But tonight we're here to talk about science. If you want to talk about that question, come on over to the church building and we'll be happy to talk with you, which was exactly the right answer. Uh -huh. and, uh, they had they had passed a law that said if you spoke in a public building, if you if you spoke anything against Buddhism, you could be fined thousands and thousands of dollars. I so it was a setup. It was a setup. It was a setup. It, yeah. it was a setup, yes. And praise God, Dave was alert enough to the spirit of God not to push forward. <laughs> Amen. I mean, this is my opportunity. God, you're missing the opportunity here. <laughs> yeah. One of the guys did come down to the church, but he looked pretty disgusted. He's looking at the flannel graphs and all the Bible stories, you know. And, yeah. yeah. That was an interesting experience because uh, we, when we started this ministry, we just us, us traveling around the country in our little Volkswagen van, just us and our two boys at the time, and never anticipated we would go outside of the U.S. to, to speak. And yet God opened doors, even in Mongolia, which at that point was just coming out of communism. And the night before we were supposed to go, we were taking our son Steve with us. He was 16 at the time. And the night before we were supposed to go, I got really scared all of a sudden. And it was like, oh, what are we doing? You know, we're going halfway around the world. We hadn't heard back confirmation from the missionary we were supposed to be going to. And all of a sudden that fear just hit me, you know, and I'm going, oh. And then, and then it was, it was just like, like this thought came into my mind, oh, Jesus, you want to go to Mongolia? I will be happy to go with you. And the fear <laughs> left just like that, and it never came back. A month that we were in Mongolia, and we got in some pretty hairy, scary situations over there. But oh yeah, you know God, God provided, and He took care of us. And yeah, that was pretty neat. Yep, I will go with you. Huh? I'll go with you. You <laughs> want to go? With you, so Jesus. I'll go with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I I won't ever forget that because that that's just amazing to me, you know. That to think that way that makes such a difference. That's well, beautiful. Tonight we're going to get in the program now, I guess. And uh, so basically, we've been looking creation design. That was the first night, 
uh, with ma amazing evidence of design. Then we looked at the big biological evidence with Mary Jo and the fossil record uh, showing that uh, we have mutations, we have things like that, we have fossils. That was uh, due to the fall and then death in struggle. Of course, the fossils in general were due to the flood and destruction as uh, mentioned in Genesis 6 through 8. So you saw some of the best evidences for evolution up here and what's wrong with them. Things that they're still presenting in classrooms, even though in the 50s, they knew those arguments weren't true, but they're still presenting them. And um, the, uh, so Mary Jo did a good job of presenting those. And then we talked about the geologic evidence for the flood. And uh, we ended up with um, saying that we're going to be talking about Genesis 9 to 11, Babel and dispersion tonight, right? Well, I promised you that tonight we're going to talk about Babel and dispersion. We're going to talk about the Ice Age, and we're going to talk about uh, the dinosaurs, <laughs> okay? Well, wait a minute. How does this all fit together, all right? And... Um, and so basically, uh, I kind of cheated last uh, yesterday, and I put the rainbow in there as a promise that God was not going to send another flood like that again. And that was an evidence that that was a worldwide flood uh, rather than a local flood, because we've had a lot of local floods. God would not have kept his promise. But the rainbow actually doesn't come until... Uh, Genesis chapter 9, does it? All right, that's where you come into it, Genesis 9 to 11. And uh, so, but the rainbow was very significant from the standpoint that after the flood, you're going to still have a lot of rain, believe it or not, a lot of rain. Dr. Larry Vardaman, meteorologist uh, who works with flood modeling, he said they're going to have what he called hypercanes just from the tremendous amount of heat in the oceans. And uh, that's going to cause huge amount of storms, kind of like El Nino effects all over the world. OK, it's basically what you would end up with. And it's that whole idea right there with a lot of rain that's going to lead to the ice age. Now, after the flood, we have very warm oceans that I mentioned. Why? Well, there's huge amounts of undersea volcanisms that you can see in the uh, geologic record. And you can tell it was formed, uh, these lavas were formed underwater because of the pillow basalt, the type of lava, the bubbles in it, etc. And you find out there are the Columbia basalts in the Pacific Northwest that cover 30,000 square miles. That's a lot of uh, undersea volcanisms going on. And there's quite a depth to those too. That's going to heat up the water a lot. But in the uh, India, the Deccan Plateau, you have big flows up to 100 and maybe even 125,000 square miles. That's even bigger. Think about the heat that produces, all right? And not only that heat, but we also see friction from the currents, all these big boulders <laughs> slamming into each other and the grand, uh, sand, grains of sand, that's friction. Then, just from the standpoint there was a lot of rain, you can change water vapor into water, it produces heat. And how about meteoritic strikes? What's that going to do? And so after the flood, we're going to find very warm oceans, not cooking everything, but we've got a lot warmer oceans than what we have today. Well, that is what is needed right now in order to produce an ice age. Secular geologists have no clue of what started that ice age. How did it come about? Why? Because the ocean 
and the land are too close in temperature. What you have to do is have hotter oceans, cooler land in order to be able to have an ice age. And, uh, but the conditions shortly after the flood are just perfect for that to happen. You've got hot oceans, very warm oceans, a lot of hot air masses coming off of those oceans. And that's going to cause a lot of rain on the continents. Now, it turns out that land mass cools down a lot more quickly than ocean water. And so the ocean, the continents begin to cool down faster than the water in the ocean. And also because of the sheer bulk of the amount of water in the ocean too. Uh, but regardless of that, you have a lot of rain, which eventually as the higher altitudes, there'll be cooler rain. Pretty soon that rain turns into a very wet snow and a lot of it. So you're gonna have eventually all kinds of snow. And that ice, that, uh, that is going to produce very good uh, type for a while of wet type of uh, snow that's going to produce wonderful ice for a glacier. And so, um, so you get just huge accumulations of all this snow, and that is what's going to lead into what we have referred to the ice age. Now, they think ice age might be um, tens of thousands of years long, uh, but uh, the ice age we're talking about here uh, that most of us are familiar with, uh, we are talking about the total advance and retreat of the glacial ice could all happen within a period of time, get this, 500 years. That's from meteorologist Michael, Dr. Michael Ord. And, uh, and those are the conditions that you would expect uh, post-flood. So think about all of that ice and those mammoths and whatever. And pretty soon, what do you end up having? A huge uh, accumulations of ice. And the ice gets to be very, very thick. In fact, the depth of the ice will be somewhere in the uh, amount of five to 10,000 feet thick, almost two miles thick over parts, say, Canada. All right. Um, but think about it. All of that water in the ice, and then you're also having some of these ice sheets in the lower uh, climates or lower altitude. Uh, parts of the United States, where it's not quite as cold or high, you're going to have a melting going on in the edges. But you have the advance of these ice uh, sheets blocking normal river channels, making great big lakes like we talked about last night, like Glacial Lake Missoula, where you have huge inland seas. So throughout the United States, throughout different parts of the world, you're going to have these giant inland seas way up in altitude compared to the ocean. And because you have so much water in those inland seas and the water in the ice, it's going to cause the lowering of the sea level. And you think right after the flood, the waters ought to be pretty high. Well, actually, for a while, it's a lot lower than it is right now. And in fact, uh, that's quite a bit lower. You look at the continental shelf that goes uh, at a great depth and you see it goes way out there. There are canyons on that continental shelf where there were rivers going on out there, but they're all submerged under a lot of water right now. And what happened is during the time of the ice age and all of these lakes forming, you're going to have huge land bridges between continents. Huge land bridges. Why is that important? Migration. 
migration of animals from Turkey all the way to North America, right? And by the way, uh, we think uh, some portion of Turkey where the Ark likely landed after Noah's flood. But uh, the uh, people in Mongolia trace their uh, heritage. You can see it right in their Natural History Museum. They trace their people group all the way from an area in Turkey, but not to Turks. And they migrated from there all the way up to settle into Mongolia. But part of their people group then went over into Korea and settled Korea and other parts of their people group actually went over the top they said and when you go over the top you end up into the North Americas okay into North America area and when you look at the cultures of let's say the uh, Eskimos the round igloos okay their hunting style or even the Navajo Indian people way down here in Arizona, et cetera, what do you find out? They have very similar culture. They are also very um, uh, similar in looks. And you can see the, and same thing in Korea, you can see the commonness of their ancestry. And uh, so, the land bridges are also going to make the migration of animals. People ask us frequently, how did the mammoths go all over? Well, the land bridges, very easily. This is what was occurring at that particular point. And in fact, there was so much water way up north of Canada that the north shore of um, Alaska was never glaciated. Why? Because you have the warmer oceans, okay? You have warmer oceans, a lot of tempering of the coastal area. And so um, uh, geologists know that the North Shore was not glaciated. And so that seems funny. We thought that it started from the Arctic, the North Pole and headed south. But no, it started in the central parts of the continent and spread radially out from there. All right. So now let's think about it. We have all these land bridges going on, etc., and all these great big lakes. But then as these glaciers begin to melt, these lakes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And remember, ice is not a good thing to dam a monster lake, right? A huge inland sea. So eventually that water collapses uh, or that dam collapses, the water escapes and then eventually ends up in the ocean, creating great big canyons downstream. Okay, so that's what we see. And there's a lot of these glacial ice dams popping. Other places where there are kind of basins water begins to fill that basin just because there's so much groundwater. Eventually, even that overtops, again, more catastrophic drainage as well, forming more, uh, more and more canyons, including the Snake River Canyon. All right, so now, so we've now had the ice age. Now we've had the breakup of that ice we see remnants of that ice today. We do know that the book of Job is considered one of the oldest books or the oldest book of the Bible in written, total written form, talks about the storehouses of ice. It talks about that. And so somehow or another, they knew about it, although glaciation probably did not hit as far down as Jerusalem would have been, okay? You would not have seen that. Uh, neither would have Colorado have been glaciated except for what we call mountain glaciers and valley glaciers. We would see that. But um, the main ice uh, basically stopped, um, you might say somewhere mid Wyoming, 
<laughs> okay, uh, as it heads further south. And so that was it. All right, so now we want to talk about Genesis 9 to 11. We're going to, we call it the Babel and dispersion. But we find other things in Genesis 9 through 11, too, that's of interest. Let me just mention a couple of those things, right? One of the things that God told the people uh, after he made a covenant. Remember the rainbow was a sign of that covenant? Well, he gave some covenantal things to Noah as he's doing that. He told us, uh, he told Noah just as I've given you the green herb to eat, people weren't eating, supposedly supposed to eat meat prior to the flood. But now it's after the flood, and uh, he says, you have now can eat meat just like you would the green herbs. All right. And he put the fear of the animals in the people or, or fear of uh, animals in the people and the fear of people into the animals. Okay. <laughs> it, it all works together there. Um, but anyhow, I'm really glad <laughs> Noah likes or was given the permission to eat meat and that, and that's extended to the rest of us mankind. Cause I sure do like to eat meat. <laughs> I do. I'm a carnivore. I have to admit it. I'm a carnivore. Um, but he also tells uh, Noah part of the covenant. Don't take human life. Don't murder in that respect. Don't murder. And that's what was the case of that. All right. Uh, the, and yes, we do have in Genesis 9, we in Genesis 9, we have the rainbow, don't we? We do have that rainbow. But also in Genesis 9, we see that God starts delineating where the different people groups uh, arise. And so in Genesis chapter 9, it mentions the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, correct? So we realize that. And then it just mentions Ham uh, was the father of Canaan. Remember the problems with the Canaanites all along? <laughs> all right. And we find out that uh, the Canaan later find out that uh, uh, the some of the progeny of uh, uh, Canaan happens to be some of the other, like the Amorites that uh, uh, the Israelite groups had issues with. Okay. Now, when we get to chapter 10, okay, chapter 10, I just hit a couple of highlights. Chapter 10 of Genesis talks about the lineage of Shem. Okay, it goes down and gives you this lineage of Shem, and you read about uh, Japheth as well. But as you go down that, it talks about Shem, and uh, basically, uh, as we go a little bit further, we find out that there is a son born by the name of Peleg, P-E-L-E-G. And it says there in scripture, and in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. What does that mean? This is one of those passages that I wish God gave a little extra sentence or two. What does that mean? The earth was divided. That has led people to think about it. What does a word divided mean? Well, it turns out uh, one of the uh, words for surveying was called dividing. Okay. All right. Dividing could have, could have mean it was divided or it could mean uh, it could mean it was surveyed. It also could mean that that might have been when the Tower of Babel actually had occurred. All right, where the nations were divided. Okay, and the people groups were divided. And so that is a possibility too. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, one thing we do know is um, it appears like there's a couple other uh, passages which seem to indicate that Peleg was a surveyor and a traveler. 
and we have some maps that were actually made um, that were found in an old collection out of the 1500s. Now, the interesting thing about these maps is uh, the antiquity of them, number one, but it had the dimension of the earth at 8,000 uh, miles. It had more of a precise dimension of the earth. Well, all the maps since the Greeks have used a round figure, let's say, of 8,000 miles uh, for the diameter of the earth. All the maps. And the people pointed to that and said, well, wait a minute, hold on. Those maps that are supposed to be so old have a correct or more correct dimension of the actual diameter of the earth. So it must be a forgery, all right? Must be so forgery because we didn't know that until recently. Well, that sounded really good, except then they said one other thing. And by the way, they totally missed Antarctica. They didn't get the right shape of Antarctica. Uh, oh, okay, that's what they said. Well, it turns out that if you, there were people taking um, um, seismic and other type of um, uh, instrumentation under uh, basically from the top of the ice in the Antarctic and going downward. And they were able to map the actual coastline of Antarctica. And guess what? It matched the ancient map, the an an antique map, the actual outline. So basically, what does that mean? It almost looks like that this map was actually made prior to when the ice formed from the Ice Age. So, mm -hmm. so that's what it looks like. And uh, uh, so uh, you can look up those maps. Um, uh, there's a book called The Journal of the Ancient Sea Kings, where it talks about that. All right. Now, that was uh, 10. Maybe Peleg was a surveyor. We don't know. Maybe the Tower of Babel had occurred there. Okay. But the other thing that you also notice in 11, et cetera, is the Tower of Babel is definitely talked about and given uh, some specific uh, uh you might say, attention in this particular case. And the Tower of Babel, when God uh, uh, confused the languages and scattered the people as a result of the confusion of the language. So there, finally, in 11, you get the dispersion, don't you? All right. And then a little bit further in chapter 11, it really delineates Shem's line, okay, and the details of it, and it gets Shem's line all the way down to Abram, who later is called Abraham. Now, that's chapter 11, and that finishes that, and it's not until you get to chapter 12 that you get to a detailed uh lineage of Abraham's line. Okay, so you get from Abraham all the way to even Abraham going into Egypt. Okay, and uh, so that's what you see. Okay, is that enough of an a, a overview of uh, Genesis 9 to 11? It's kind of the big picture. Any questions on that? I do have a question. And it goes back to when you were talking about the um, how the Ice Age was formed. Okay. So you're talking about um, all right. There there have been mammoths found that were rapidly frozen. Okay. And, and I always, in my mind, related that to the same kind of creatures that would have been rapidly buried in the flood. Mm -hmm. But these these were rapidly frozen in ice. But how how does that fit with the rain to slush to snow to ice? I mean, that seems to take a long 
that wouldn't be catching me eating a blade of grass and it going down in my stomach. Okay, there you go. Uh, good question. A very good question. And um, let me give you a really good answer. I don't okay. know. No, I have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea, but I don't know for a fact. Uh, however, we do uh, think about one thing according to the model. Remember I said that the North Shore of Alaska was never glaciated? And any of those areas that's close to big bodies of water that would be warmer would not be quite as cold. And so we have uh, possibly, because of the tempering of the ocean, we have a lot of uh, warmth there. Uh, we, uh, Mary Jo and I used to live in Sitka, Alaska. And uh, we taught at a college up there for uh, three years. And it was interesting. You think we're way up in Alaska, but you know what? The coldest temperature that we had up there in the three years we were there was like uh, six or nine degrees above zero. So that was the coldest. And uh, so was we, that on the coast? I don't know where Sitka is. Was that Sitka, on the coast? Yeah, Sitka is on an island. Okay. There's a group of islands coming down along the coast of British Columbia. Okay. And uh, so it would be uh, west of Juneau, the capital, which is along the coast. All right. And so we had a lot of rain, huge amounts of rain there, but it wasn't all that cold there. And um, so now these mammoths are uh, along these areas where there's lots of water and they're chomping on buttercups and whatever, right? It's a little chilly. They're putting on a pretty good coat, <laughs> a fur coat for the woolly mammoths, right? Uh, but it's getting chilly, but they're still able to do it. Now, in Montana, there was a uh, recorded um, uh, difference from one day to the next in temperature. They had a snow and a cold front come in and uh, the difference between one day to the next was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. It, can you imagine that? Now think about these glaciers forming and all of these ice fields beginning to form in the higher altitudes and even up into areas through Alaska, through the uh, uh, mountains there as well. The mammoths are having fun. They have a, a favorable breeze coming off of the ocean. They're per perfectly happy. And then all of a sudden, the wind's currents shift. Now the wind is coming off of the glacier. And what they thought, all of a sudden, they realized their wool coat is not working as well. And they become uh, basically die off, uh, freeze, and are covered with ice later. OK, because um, and that's all it takes. I, even in Colorado, once it snows one day, the next day, wow, you, uh, all of a sudden the temperature in Grand Junction goes down. All right. And uh, so uh, that might so be what, what you're saying is they died that. of the cold. They yeah. died of the cold and then the ice covered them later. Well, they died of the cold, but they also the cold front could also bring with it storm and uh, amount of, uh, of um, whatever, or they were migrating, or they're trying to migrate and got trapped in crevasses, etc. But there's a lot of mammoths up there frozen in the ice. Uh, but a good share of the mammoths are actually preserved standing upright, right. in, not in just in ice, but in sand type and loam and silt. Oh. And so uh, that's kind of like uh, being in Egypt in a dust storm and uh, where everything is, gets buried quickly. And so that is probably part of the conditions following the flood, I'm going to guess. And a lot of the bones we find of mammoths happen to be preserved in Flood deposits, flood deposits, even gravel deposits. And uh, that's probably uh, 
comes out during the flood. Okay. And then when they repopulate, then they're going to get frozen or they may even be uh, uh, buried in sands. Okay. But, but, but remember what, what actually caused then the, uh, uh, the retreat of the ice well, all the waters uh, now and the ice cooling down the oceans, as soon as you cool down the ocean enough, you don't have those hot air masses coming across, rejuvenating the ice field. And so the ice is going to melt back and it's still melting back today. Okay. And so, all right, now let's go on here. Uh, let's talk about the dinosaurs. How do they fit into the biblical perspective? Okay. Mary Jo and I were speaking, okay, in um, uh, Costa Rica. And our translator, he worked on our slides, actually titled. She actually made a difference in our title. And she said, prehistoric species and humans. And I thought this is really good. This is a teaching opportunity. Why? I asked the students, what's pre, I asked them, and I asked my first, uh, and I've been doing it ever since, what's prehistoric? Prehistory, right? Yeah. What did you say, uh, Deborah, that the Bible is? A History. historical document. Right. Correct? Right. Starts in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, right? Ah, oh, wait a minute. There's nothing prior to that. There's, there isn't Christ any prehistoric. God. There's nothing prehistoric. And uh, we're going to find out that even the uh, dinosaurs lived since the time of Genesis 1-1. Okay? So we're going to see that. I wouldn't have believed that when I was young. That's a picture of me teaching how the dinosaurs actually proved evolution as long as, as well as the fossil record. And uh, basically, I would say that uh, the um, dinosaurs died out in the Jurassic, and then people didn't come onto the scene until way up here, just in the last few minutes of time, and uh, geologically. Okay, and then I told you about the. Uh, backbone of a dinosaur with an arrowhead embedded in it yesterday, didn't I? Was I did yesterday? Yes. Well, or day before. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember you I talking did. about it. <laughs> yeah, you heard me talking about it, right? Well, basically, that, that's because we think, supposedly, that people and dinosaurs are separated by millions and millions of years. But my contention tonight is, no, they weren't separated by millions of years. And I ignored a very important fossil, which would show that. It looked like somebody was hunting dinosaurs, okay? Well, young people like me watch these television programs, and they are led to believe evolution is a proven fact. And right from even four, year, ages four, five, six, they're led to believe in evolution because of the dinosaur books and all the dinosaur programs. All right. And uh, so it wasn't until that book that I started evaluating my perspective. And uh, later I found out that uh, Dr. Gish uh, uh, updated his book, Evolution, the Fossils Still Say No. Okay. Anyhow. So basically what we see that we've been talking about the belief system, naturalism, posing as science. And that actually goes right along with what we find out about dinosaurs. We have a millions of years evolutionary perspective that are taught, that is taught to the students all the time. And keep in mind, a dinosaur bone that's petrified is just as petrified for a creationist as it is for an evolutionist, right? So that's not the problem. It's the interpretation of that data. Here's a Grand Junction, Colorado Museum exhibit. The definition of a fossil, even in the museum here, any evidence of life more than 7,000 years old, how do they get that number? 
Right. And that's so that there wouldn't ever be a creationist who's young Earth who could possibly be a paleontologist. They wouldn't have any fossils. <laughs> I think that's what's going on here. And uh, tonight, we want to ask a question. How do you know that? We've always already asked, what is the evidence, right? And when a ranger is talking about this happened millions of years ago, politely ask him if he was there and they and saw that happen. <laughs> no, that's not a good thing to do. Uh, how do you know that? That's a very good one. Here's another dinosaur exhibit in the Grand Junction at a local museum. It says the Lophosaurus and other di d dinosaurs were well suited to hot desert life where water is scarce. Uh, hold on, time out. Just because we find the bones today in a desert environment, does that mean they lived in a desert? Absolutely <laughs> not. When you find a great big uh, sauropod that is 55 tons roughly, that's going to take a lot more food than what you're going to find in a desert, okay? Especially for supposedly a plant eater. And, uh, but Nick, look, listen to the next one. To conserve water, <clears throat> they didn't sweat. Oh, come on. How do you know that? Right. All right. How do you know that? That's good story. We go to the museums, go to the textbooks. They throw a lot of good story in. And that's not based in fact, because you don't know if it would sweat or would not sweat. Here's another one. T-Rex's primary prey were Triceratops and the duck-billed dinosaurs. Time out. How do they know that? How many dinosaur T-Rex skeletons have been found with a duck-billed dinosaur or a Triceratops in his stomach? If you say zero, you're right on. <laughs> okay. Oh, so you can't identify that as the primary prey. All right, let's continue. Um, how many have been to, uh, uh, have seen Jurassic Park? Yeah. Yeah, okay. They show the big claw, the star of that first original one was Utah Raptor. And they have actually found that for in Utah, pretty not too far away from our house. And the interesting thing about it, it had a big claw. And so they said, aha, that big claw was used for ripping flesh. And that became the <laughs> one of the things of Jurassic Park. Uh, by the way, uh, the raptor was actually reconstructed from only parts of five bones. One of which was the claw. Parts of five bones. And from that, they got the whole creature for Jurassic Park, okay? But what can you tell from the claw? Look at those monster claws. Wow, don't want to meet up with that at night, I'll tell you. Well, actually, not too bad because it belongs to a blue jay. <laughs> I was thinking it looked like a bird. <laughs> yeah, it's a bird claw, but it looks pretty vicious, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, uh, don't have nightmares tonight and... Uh, but uh, basically, those are some giant claws, too. But it's a uh, kinkajou. And uh, it uses those claws to fight its way into a honeycomb. That's mm -hmm. his favorite food. Now, you got giant claws on a sloth, right? right? But what does he use that for? Hanging upside down from a tree limb. And he can actually lock those claws into place and go to sleep right there. <laughs> and so you can't tell about a claw, can you? What it's going to use it for at all. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a dinosaur that was found with a nine inch claw. Wow, that's a big one. But you know what they were saying? It was not used because it's a plant eating dinosaur they think from the teeth structure a plant eater well what if they use the big claw now they say oh it use those claws to pull down branches so they can eat the leaves so it's not very consistent here all right look at that big tooth of t-rex wow that must be used for eating meat. But wait a minute. How do you know what he ate? 
we weren't there. We didn't see them. The only way to tell what the uh, T-Rex would eat is to have one today. Take them to McDonald's restaurant. See if they orders the chef salad or the chef that made the salad. That's the only way to tell for sure. Uh, but, you know, we have animals like uh, the look at the big teeth of the fruit bat. But he uses it to peel his favorite kind of fruit, big teeth. This is the nectar bat teeth. And uh, the spider monkey is another fruit eater. And not only that, we have pandas. Favorite prey happens to be bamboo shoots, even though it has those big canine teeth. All right. Uh, maybe T-Rex's favorite food is watermelon. <laughs> we don't know. We weren't there. We didn't see it, did we? And so you just can't tell from the tooth what something would eat. Well, when did they live? When did dinosaurs live? Well, according to Genesis chapter 1, God created man on day 6. But what day did he create land animals? Day 6. Most dinosaurs or many dinosaurs are land animals. So they're created on the very same day. Ah, so people and dinosaurs were contemporaneous. Oh, okay. That would fit with that one, wouldn't it? That really would. That after the fall, people started hunting dinosaurs. Um, by the way, they have found unfossilized dinosaur bone in Alaska. How do you do that? And it had nothing to do with the ice. Okay. Nothing to do with the ice. And so there it is. Uh, now they found soft tissue and DNA strands in dinosaur bone. And that has caused a huge rift in the scientific community there. And in fact, the person who was working with um, uh, uh, Bacher, the famous paleontologist uh, studying dinosaurs, uh, found the soft tissue and uh, then went to publish some of her finding. And she said, I had one reviewer, reviewer tell me that what that he didn't care what the data said. He knew what I was finding, soft tissue and dinosaur, wasn't possible. Doesn't fit with the millions of years, right? Now I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? And he said, no. none. Okay. That's not open-minded science, is it? Um, and by the way, when I was about 12 to 15, I used to, uh, years old, I used to uh, cut and polish a lot of petrified dinosaur bone. They, we made a lot of jewelry out of it, too. And uh, I actually had times where I was grinding on a piece of petrified dinosaur bone. that's solid rock. And all of a sudden, I found out, ew, where's that rotten egg smell coming from? It's coming right from the, the I didn't realize the significance of it, but it was coming from the actual rotting tissue inside of dinosaur bone. And so what it says is that month, that can't be a hundred million years old. It had to happen quickly. We said that, or I said that at a university lecture. Uh, do you remember the professor that shouted at Mary Jo about the um, uh, junk DNA is not junk? He said, it's a lie. Well, the same professor the next year, actually did some research she didn't say a word when we mentioned the uh junk dna uh, dna is not junk but when i mentioned soft tissue and dinosaur bone he said ah oh, it's just biofilm when he stood up in the lecture it's just biofilm which means biological film that came much later okay has nothing to do with the actual rotting flesh but guess what he was wrong with that and the next year he did it was totally tight lip when we mentioned uh, uh, soft tissue and dinosaur bone again so he kept coming to those presentations which praise the lord for that okay and now the latest argument against the soft tissue is maybe there was so much iron because of uh, blood that what happened was it preserved the soft tissue. Oh, really? The higher iron's going to do it. All right. 
And so that's the latest theory that they came up with. So they did some research and for uh, in uh, two years time, and they found out some ostrich tissue did not decay when soaked in pure hemoglobin that they got from the chemistry lab. Okay. All right. But the problem with this is this, it's not the answer. Yeah, two years is a far cry from 180 million years, okay? Um, and then some of those fossils that I mentioned had soft tissue are over supposedly, according to the evolutionary model, 500 million years old. And so how do you preserve that? Uh, you're not going to. And by the way, uh, iron is not present with many of those fossils. Uh, so you don't see that, period. Um, and um, so that is not the answer for the soft tissue. And then the lab results use the concentrated hemoglobin. You don't find that, all right? You don't find that anywhere. Uh, okay, now also, in order for this experiment to work, they had to keep this ostrich tissue totally dry. But we have to bury it deeply and rapidly. How do you bury these bones? They always say that most of them are found in fluvial river deposits or water deposits. And so they're saturated. So we're, there's another problem with their research going on here. And um, so, all right. So basically one of the best books, I like this one, Guide to Dinosaurs. And you get that from us. This would be a wonderful uh, Christmas present to, you can give to all of your kids and grandkids. And by the way, you can do all your shopping by calling the AOI office. And you got Christmas taken care of. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but this is a picture of one of my belt buckles right here. Petrified dinosaur bone. Interesting thing about it is look at the black material in here. You're actually seeing the cell walls of the actual cell, uh, cell uh, bone cells of the dinosaur. All right. And then these get replaced with beautiful little agates. All right. And uh, so some of that stuff makes wonderful jewelry. So colorful. And, um, but they decided to carbon date that bone. They were assuming it's going to be millions of years old. Oh, there should not be any carbon-14 left because the half-life is so short. But they tried it anyhow. And what did they end up with? Thousands of years, not millions of years, carbon dating. Now, the radioactive decay dating, you can find similar problems, but... That was carbon dating. So they tried coal deposits, same thing, thousands. And um, they figure, oh, there's contamination going on there. Uh, so they tried something that maybe water would not co uh, contaminate. And so it's made out of carbon. And that was pure diamond. It won't penetrate. And so they crushed down pure diamonds. Guess what they ended up with when they went to the lab? thousands of years, even on the diamonds that were supposedly millions of years old. Not, uh, okay. And so that's what they actually found. All right. Well, what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? Well, look in Job 40 and you find it's a creature called behemoth. Uh, behold behemoth now, which I created with you. We think it was probably in Job chapter 40, talking about a potential of a dinosaur. And, um, it says in Job 40, he moves his tail like a cedar. Now, a lot of people that would say, oh, Job never knew anything about dinosaurs, would say he's big. He's a land animal. He's big. Oh, maybe Behemoth was an elephant. Or maybe a hippopotamus. Well, when you look at the tail of an elephant, it's not much. I wouldn't call that a cedar tree or a hippopotamus tail is virtually non-existent. Okay. Virtually non-existent. I would call that tail a cedar tree, the tail of a great big old dinosaur, whether you're talking about T-Rex or a patasaurus or a brontosaurus, whatever you want to call it. Okay. 
the uh, Gilgamesh epic talks about slaying a dragon. It looks like the description is of a dinosaur. Well, wait a minute. What could that thing have been? All right. What could it have been? Well, guess what? It's not just the Gilgamesh epic talking about it, but we find other uh, sources talking about that as well. Now, anybody believe in dragons? I go to the university. I might have one student putting his hand inside of his shirt and just going wiggling it up and down like he does. He's afraid to tell anybody else he <laughs> believes in dragons. <laughs> and uh, and I didn't turn off my sound right then, did I? Okay. No. Okay. All right. But did dragons breathe fire? Well, you look at cultures around the world, guess what? They talk about fire-breathing dragons, don't they? And we read in Job 41 about Leviathan. And it says there, there in the bottom, Job 41, um, his breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Whoa, this is some creature. What is it? And as you read the discussion, uh, what it says about it, and uh, the, I kind of wondering if it was something like, not an alligator, but one of the prehistoric, eh, did I say the word prehistoric? There's no such thing as that. But one of the fossils of a creature that would have dwarfed the alligators and crocodiles today. This would have been approximately 40 feet long. And if you figure a Volkswagen Beetle is about uh, 14 feet long, um, I looked that up today, uh, that would be like three Volkswagens put end to end and weighing approximately the same amount. And so that's a big creature. Do you realize just the skull alone is over six feet long, the height of a person, of a of somebody taller than me. Wow. And the description talks about the scales being so tight. And it says, are you going to pierce them with a spear? Are you going to draw them out with a fish hook? Think about how big that thing is. You're not going to get him with a fish hook, are you? Yeah. Uh, anyhow, but it says it, people say it can't be an alligator. Or a crocodile because they you can pierce those. You can the scales, you can pierce it right through. So it can't be. However, these guys had huge scales. See these markings on it as well? Those are all attachments knitting these scales tightly together. That's kind of sounds sounding a little bit like it could be a, a uh, one of these creatures. Um, anyhow, but could it breathe fire? It's hard telling, right? You know, think about it. Look at this particular snout here. Why is this big bulb on the end of the nose? Unless it's a chemical mixing tube. A little beetle has those chemical mixing in its abdomen. And I mentioned that in the very first night, shooting basically fire. And if a little guy like that, what about these big bonehead dinosaurs or other things? Maybe that was a good thing that they ended up doing at the, this particular dinosaur here, one of the boneheads or most of them. The, when you take a cross section of the skull, you find out that it would make a perfect chemical mixing tube to be able to produce fire. All right. And so... They're called the Hattasar dinosaur, boneheads, okay? So is there really such a thing as a dragon? I believe when you see cultures from around the world talking about them and the commonality that there were things called dragons. But it's also my contention what they saw were dinosaurs. They lived alongside of them. Or I wouldn't live right next to one. <laughs> but uh, basically, and they were actually called them dragons 
which the classical definition of a dragon meant large reptile. That's what it was. A dragon was a large reptile. Marco Polo visited China in 1271 AD, reported the emperor raised dragons to pull his chariots in parades. So they're big enough to be able to pull chariots. And they're probably pretty powerful. We read about St. George getting its fame, his fame, known as the Dragon Slayer. That's where his fame come from, and he was later sainted. All right. And uh, basically, there are many different uh, plates of him killing or slaying a dragon, and they look like dinosaur types or flying reptiles like pterosaurs. Okay, the type of dinosaur-like reptile that was flying. And we will think about some of the pictures that he has and the paintings. There, we know those in the museums today, and we call those dinosaurs. All right. I take students down here, Natural Bridges National Monument, and we take them for a long hike, and we come out to the bottom here to the bridge. Along the way, we pass Indian uh, things. My friend, Dr. Uh, Alan Galbraith here. Uh, but anyhow, but we get to the bridge and then we see that creature, which is very hard to see nowadays. But if you lighten it up, here's what you're looking at. And this is what that looked like. And it looks like a type of dinosaur, doesn't it? Okay, that's what it looks like. Well, we also find Havasu Canyon in Arizona. You find this thing uh, on the uh, cliffs and it looks just exactly like Trachodon that's in the museums today. Here is well, Wapatki National Park, just east of the Grand Canyon. And they uh, it's actually belching fire or smoke. And uh, so they called it Puff the Magic Dragon, actually. Puff the Magic Dragon. This is from the Middle Ages. And here's somebody getting ready to kill this dragon, which looks like a pterosaur. Paleontologists say, wow, whoever drew this knew what a pterosaur actually looked like, because that's exactly what we would reconstruct it as based upon the fossil record. All right, Manitou Springs. We find an Indian prayer stick and right in their exhibit. And uh, that looks like uh, one of the pterosaurs. Again, flying reptiles. All right, this is out of the Asian collection in 1400 AD. And when you look at this clay figurine, you look at the three toes in the front here and in the back. And you look at the structure of the skull, it's identical to what it would have been Ovi Raptor, one of Bakker's museum, uh, of Bakker's uh, dinosaurs. And so Ovi Raptor, that's almost identical to that. These guys are hunting in the Amazon basin. What are they dancing around? Well, look at that figure. That's it looks like a sauropod dinosaur. They're hunting it. Remember the arrowhead and the backbone of the dinosaur? This is people from ancient Sumatra hunting. Must be big word from Sesame Street or something, right? <laughs> uh, no, Corythosaurus probably. Crithosaurus is what it looked like in that drawing. Ornamental uh, box uh, uh, from China here. What do you have? Look at this. Look just like sauropod dinosaurs on it. Okay. These guys are hunting. They're trying to kill the crocodile leopard here. That's a mosaic. And that they thought was extinct 65 million years ago. And um, along with the rest of the dinosaurs. These guys are actually trying to kill this guy. This is out of Israel. And uh, we have that as a dinosaur in the museums today, except they don't have the ears on it in the museum. Well, ears are not preserved in the fossil record frequently or most all the time. And so this is probably a better depiction. Uh, this is a Mesopotamian cylinder before Christ. And they look like they're depicting this type of dinosaur right here. We've got Peruvian burial stones with dinosaurs on it. And people say, oh, well, 
A lot of them are fakes. We can't, we better not use those. Well, my friend is a photographer, has actually photographed hundreds of these things. And he said, I can always tell the fake from the original because of the patina. And, um, and sure enough, some of the original ones have dinosaurs on those particular burial stones, approximately a thousand years old. And uh, he said, yeah, there's a lot of fakes because people started going down there and saying, you ever see any of these burial stones with dinosaurs on them? Boy, if you call me, I'll pay you big bucks for them. And all of a sudden, the people in Peru said, this is a good way to make money. <laughs> okay. And so a lot of fakes began to flood the market, but they have the wrong patina. This is the temple in Cambodia. And what is that creature? Right there. It looks like a stegosaurus, doesn't it? And how, what do you think the people in the jungles in Cambodia, where that temple was constructed, it's now a national park there. What do you think they were looking at? Probably a dinosaur. A pottery. Again, eliminate the ears. You have this type of dinosaur that we have in museums today. All right. Uh, we go to Mexico and we also find. Uh, artifacts there as well with dinosaur looking stegosauruses etc people fighting them wow i think they actually saw them this is bishop bell's tomb and when you look at the brass engraving around that tomb you find out that that looks identical to that type of dinosaur right there and so all right let's not worry about that uh this is um an interesting article came out just not too many years ago. It was the new fossil that was found called, they called it Dracorex. Dracorex, okay? And in fact, the lady was a historian and she started talking about Dr Dracorex, okay? And uh, basically, uh, she said this, the skull of Dracorex looks strangely familiar to anyone who has studied dragons. And she is, uh, studies dragons from around the world. And he says, Dracorex, Dracorex has remarkable resemblance to the dragons of ancient China and medieval Europe. That's what she said. Oh, paleontologist said, oh, somebody must have found the skull of Dracorex in China. And that's what led to all of these uh, uh, myths about dragons. Sounds really good, but guess where the skull was found? The only time it was found in the world, North Dakota, <laughs> United States, a long ways from China or Europe, isn't it? And so basically it doesn't fit what they say, but look at all these nubs these would have been where horns would be in, be attached, okay? So the horns would be a lot longer than those little stubs here. This is the core. Okay. And uh, basically, one of the things that Adrian Mayer said at Stanford is what she said. She was a fossil historian there at uh, Stanford. Uh, she said, a lot of paleontologists are now recognized recognizing the dinosaur dragon connection. I just read that quote earlier today, actually. All right. And uh, basically you look at this book called Dragons, uh, Legends and Lore of Dinosaurs. It talks about so many of the sightings all over the world. Then there's a videotape called Dragons and Dinosaurs. We have that one in our bookstore here too. But when you look at the inside of it, look at that creature. That looks just like Dracorex. <laughs> a pretty, pretty close to it. Any, anyhow. And so, yeah, I think dinosaurs and dragons were one and the same. Why were they so big? A lot of theories. A lot of theories. One is they lived to be as old as Methuselah. And if you keep uh, feeding uh, reptiles, they keep growing. It's called indeterminate growth. And if a dinosaur was a reptile, could live as old as Methuselah, it could get pretty good size, couldn't it? A lot bigger than the elephants today. Some people say there was a water vapor canopy surrounding the world at one time. Yes, possible, but not as thick 
of a canopy that they've been trying to use to be able to uh, talk about the Noahic flood being as a result of the collapse of that canopy. But I still say, based upon some geologic evidence, I see evidence that the earth was a lot warmer in the past, which fits with a gas canopy. Water vapor would work beautifully for that, which when it collapsed would cause an awful lot of rain. All right. But it would also block some of the ultraviolet rate, x-rays, gamma rays, and that in itself would make conditions on the earth nice and warm, but blocking out a lot of the harmful radiation. The earth could have been like a giant greenhouse. Now, I'm not saying that the canopy models for sure. Uh, there's issues with how thick it is, how much cloud cover there would be, et cetera. And, but we couple that too with the possibility of the um, magnetic field being greater in the past, which would produce a bigger magnetic uh, or the Van Allen belts, which shields us from a harmful radiation. And we may not get quite as many of the mutational effects. Now, so both of these things could influence longevity. However, possibly the biggest thing to influence longevity is our genetic makeup. All right. I come from a long line of uh, people who uh, have a pretty good uh, genetic makeup. Uh, my grandmother just passed away, uh, had passed away, just under 101. Okay. My dad was planning to live to 100 until he fell and broke a hip and and didn't do well in surgery or after surgery, uh, but uh, at 97, uh, et cetera. And so uh, genes have a lot to do with longevity. And that is one of the uh, uh, theories for why people lived longer in the past, including Noah and uh, all the ancient patriarchs. It turns out after the flood, the lifespan started going down very predictably. So something was entering in, which started that downward trend. Okay. So we don't know exactly what it was. So maybe that's why they were so big. They could live long periods of time, but it wasn't just dinosaurs that were large. We have ammonites that a squid-like creature lived in, the same size of a large tractor tire. That's amazingly large, okay? We have uh, roaches that were, uh, yipes, that long, okay? But that's enough to use them for a footstool, right? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, sea spiders, there's a quarter for size comparison right here. And so things were larger in the past. Beavers, seven feet long. That's a big beaver. Anyhow, uh, so, so that might explain something. That maybe the difference in the climate after the flood, not as much nutrition after the flood, et cetera. We just don't know for sure. What killed the dinosaurs? We find out, well, there are a lot of theories. They were killed by mammals. Okay, yep especially people, <laughs> okay? St. George got his fame killing dragons. May the, oh, wait a minute. They talked about climate change. I thought that was just a modern thing. No climate changes possibly led to extinction of uh, dinosaurs way back when. How about a meteor strike? That's a big one these days. But usually textbooks never mention the flood, which really killed most of the dinosaurs. And I emphasize the words most. Why? Well, we do know there was flood legends all over the world, right? And people think, well, what happened to the dinosaurs? Didn't they fit on board the boat, right? Maybe they're too big. Well, take young dinosaurs, right? Take young ones, because by the way, that boat was big. I mentioned that last night, all right? Very few dinosaurs had to go on board, actually. Very few types. Uh, there's only basically nine different types of dinosaurs. And within those types, they had a lot of room for variation. And so you're not going to take two of each 
type or kind or species, you might say. And by the way, dinosaurs started off in eggs. The largest eggs were ever found were about the size of a large football. All right. And maybe up to 18 inches long. So by the, when they hatched out, they were cute and cuddly. And you can sneak that one by Mrs. Noah, but not big ones. Okay. Um, there you are. So why not take the younger ones to have their full reproductive life ahead of them? All right. And so the dinosaur extinction, they don't know. Some say they took up smoking. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. That was a, a Gary Larson cartoon. They took up smoking. And uh, basically, they don't know for sure. But I have a feeling that, yeah, a lot of these things happened. Maybe you could feed a family for a week on one dinosaur leg or one dragon leg. Okay. St. George got his fame slaying dragons. It became the in thing to kill a dragon. And when that's the in thing, if you have to kill a dragon to win the fair hand of the maiden, you're going to go out and do it. All these macho guys are going to do that. Right. And, um, they're going to go kill dragons just to show how brave they are. And so, but anyhow, National Geographic says, uh -uh, they're not extinct. Look for a major bird feeder. All right. And I already mentioned that. And we can go into great detail on that one. But I'm not going to tonight. Uh, but um, we found out there's a, 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 everybody... People don't like it that National Geographic did that. And it turned out the hoaxes in here as well. And so many of the different dinosaurs, they said, were dinosaurs with feathers. No, they fell out of the sky already because of the hoax, okay? Putting a, putting fossils together, etc. All right. So I want to mention the last thing here. The last thing. This was National Geographic, and it showed a picture of how a dinosaur was going to evolve into a bird. They show how a leg eventually evolved into a wing. Then they show you all of these different fossils, and the well, artistic renditions of what they think they found. And they ended up with dinosaurs eventually taken off and flying away. Okay. Here's the problem with all that. This is all great artwork. Even this is great artwork, like we talked about day before yesterday. All right. The real order. Here's the problem. You find true birds flying around today. Yes, at the very end of the line. But if you go backwards in time, let's say evolutionary time frame 225 million years ago there's fossil record that there were birds there but wait a minute we have birds there we have birds over here all of these birds or these uh, birds are actually came before the dinosaurs so instead of all these dinosaurs coming first it's all the birds are first then you then the dinosaurs and then more birds wait a minute how could dinosaurs then be the great great granddaddy of birds if they've already been there before dinosaurs that's a major problem the national geographic didn't give you the true order here so what do they say Ah, no problem, says Kevin Padian, the University of California, who is pushing the dinosaur to bird evolution. He says, we don't always get everything in the fossil record in perfect order. Do you think he's ignoring something here? Yeah, that is a big problem, a very, very big problem. And yet they're not, they're afraid to mad, admit it. Why? naturalism has taught them that dinosaurs one of the big proofs for evolution and they learned that as children and so they can't handle something which goes against 
their preconceived ideas here. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Any questions? Nope. All right. We covered it all, right? All you have to do is see Berkeley on that to know that you don't need to pay attention to it. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good evening, Dan. You're muted. How Can't are you, Dave? You. How I'm are fine. You How are you? I'm doing well, fine. Boy, this was a very, very interesting presentation. I sure appreciate it. Well, good. I hope it's been helpful to give you a little bit more information than maybe that I've even given when, I, when I've been in your church in the past. Yeah, yeah. No, you're always adding something new. That's for sure. Oh, that <laughs> is true. <laughs> yeah. You are evolving. You are evolving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I. so. No. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Mary Jo? It is, uh, time, our time is up now. Yeah, we're, uh, we just want to uh, invite you to sign up for that uh, astronomy class that will be coming up. That's going to be Tuesday nights, starting uh, August 23rd. And Brian Mariani will be the primary teacher for those classes that will go for six weeks. Once a week for six Once weeks. A week for six weeks. And then following that six weeks, um, Scott Mauser will be doing a class on the reliability of scripture. Oh. And so we're, we're going to be hitting, try to kind of alternate. I don't know that we'll completely do that, but we'll have a science topic and, and a worldviews topic. And these are the courses that we are in process um, that, that would be used with students coming for a full year. But we're gonna we're gonna spread it out over two years, maybe a little longer even, to get those all in. So we want to let you know about that, and we will be repeating this particular series. Um, August on eight, eight through eleven. Eight through eleven. We're gonna and start. That, those will be morning sessions, ten o'clock so, to eleven thirty. So if you know people that should. Get in on these, or if you know homeschoolers especially, we'd like to start uh, reaching to some homeschool moms, probably, and high school kids. Um, and junior high and elementary, by the way. Well, Because most yes. of these programs are good enough for a fifth grader on up. Yeah, fifth grade up. I would not say the littlest ones unless no, they're no, no, very no. interested. <laughs> I know, Dave, you always think they're going to be, but... <laughs> really above the heads of most second and third graders, although there are a few. Yep. There are a few, yeah. <laughs> one of our one of our grandson's friends, I tell you what, that kid is a genius. He's <laughs> always got something to ask about creation. He wants to be a creation speaker. And we, are, we are really hoping he pursues that. <clears throat> it's great. Also, if, yeah, and if uh, pray for AOI. Um, we're in the middle of a major remodel of our building. Um, yeah. the, the upstairs was being used for commercial. And then when uh, COVID came, the company that was up there finished off their lease, but they did not re, they didn't sign up to renew. lease it again. They didn't renew their lease because they figured out they could do their, have all their people at home, work at home. So so the upstairs have been vacant for a couple of years, and we we have decided we're going to convert it into housing. Uh, we're only a half a block from the college, so we're looking at using it for student housing and uh, looking for students that would like to be part of a discipleship program. So that's a prayer request. That, we want uh, those students to help impact the Colorado Mesa University campus. That's the plan. So they would live there. They would have that fellowship and be discipled, um, take part in our Tuesday night classes on worldview and, and uh, creation stuff, and then go out on campus and do surveys on campus. Uh, Brian has developed a survey that he uses on campus to kind of be a, a icebreaker with people. 
And that's been very interesting to see. So that's in the works. Um, some of you know the Johnsons, uh, Lanny and Marilyn Johnson. They're doing a vacation Bible school, a, a kids camp this week at uh, Twin Peaks Bible Camp. And probably tonight, even doing a gospel message they usually do on Thursday night. So, Father, we want to pray right now for any of those children yeah. or adults that are at that camp that need to know you. We pray that the uh, gospel message would penetrate their hearts and that uh, these kids would give their lives to you, Lord, that they would submit to you and they would receive the gift of salvation from you. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh -huh. Father, I thank you for the ministry of AOI. I know it's made a tremendous difference in my life and in the lives of many, many people. Father, I, I ask that you that you give a curiosity to people, that they'll that they'll be interested when people speak about creation. Even if they're skeptics at first, and even if they're mocking at first, that they'll they'll have an interest in it and that we can point them to this resource, Lord, and that it will, it will encourage them in you and encourage them in everything they need in life. Thank you, Lord, for the work that they do. Please keep, keep these wonderful people safe as in, in everything and, and watch over them, give them more wisdom, more revelation, and help them spread your word. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 All right. We also have the Yellowstone trip coming up. If any of you would like to be part of that, um, that will be the last weekend. Of August, August. August 26 to uh, 31. 26. And then also the 17, next weekend 19, over Labor Day. 30. 